Hello? Yeah, it works. Does it? Yeah. Well, thank you, the organizer, for inviting me. It's great to be in a nice and um, not too hot place compared to Boston. <laughs> um, my in my lecture, I cannot compete with Bill in terms of going back billions of years in terms of time scale, but I have a better title. We are going to talk about the abyss. <laughs> so we're going to try and maybe I shouldn't even try to tell you what the abyss is right now because we'll understand it as we go through the lecture and actually it's only at the end of the lecture that I'll be more quantitative in explaining what I mean specifically by the abyssal ocean circulation. For the moment you can understand that it's the deep circulation so it's away from the surface boundary layer which is exposed directly to surface forcing. But we'll be a bit more specific about what we mean. So this just to give you a bit of an idea of what we are going to discuss today. This is just an introductory lecture. I'm trying to give you some of the basic information and the history uh, up to present time of what we know about the deep ocean. So I call it deep just to avoid the word abyss right now because we'll be a bit more specific about what the abyss really is. So we discuss both what the deep, what I mean by deep ocean and what is the deep ocean circulation. And uh, we'll see the deep ocean circulation is the circulation that spans the depth of the ocean down all the way to the ocean bottom. The average depth of the ocean is around four kilometers, so everything down to four kilometers. And we'll see that the circulation we review is fed by sinking of water at high latitudes that come into the deep ocean. We review a bit the arguments of how that happens. That part of the story is actually reasonably well understood. Most of the theory, the discussion, and the open question are more how this water comes back to the surface after, I after it sinks in the abyssal ocean. And for today, we're just going to review mostly the two key arguments that you can find in uh, pretty much all textbooks on physical oceanography. There are quite a few now. There didn't used to be many more over the last 10 years. There is a number of them. And the two fundamental papers that these textbooks are based on is one, the theory of Stommel Arons, that mostly describe the return of the circulation to the surface and its impact on the horizontal circulation as well in the abyssal ocean. And the second argument instead is more trying to connect to what Bill was talking about is how this abyssal circulation is maintaining the deep stratification of the ocean and how the waters do indeed come back to the surface. So these are the two arguments we're going to review in detail, in some detail. And then uh, we'll come back at the end of the lecture and trying to understand to what extent these theories uh, explain the observed ocean circulation as we know it now with more modern techniques and more extensive observation of the abyssal ocean which was not really available when either of these two papers were written. And so this is what I want to cover in this lecture which is the first lecture then I have two more lectures in the second one we'll spend some time in understanding how we measure the turbulence that supports the deep and abyssal ocean circulation. Um, I thought that we should spend some time because, well, you've already seen it in Bill's lecture, people like to make statements about oceanography measuring abyssal turbulence. When you actually go in detail and see how that is measured, you're a bit less confident in the numbers that are being put forward and you start understanding what error bars are really involved. To the degree of what Bill was talking about, yes, we know those numbers to that level of accuracy, but for example, if you want to integrate the whole epsilon and see whether that balances uh, the f uh, tidal forcing at the ocean surface, you don't have the accuracy necessary to do a calculation of that kind. So we'll spend some time in reviewing the theoretical arguments and the techniques that are used based on those theoretical arguments and the uh, question of mixing efficiency, how you actually estimate the rate at which turbulence act on the abyssal ocean. And we'll review a number of experiments to just convince you that the approach is not as hopeless as you might think after you hear the theoretical arguments underpinning it but at the same time with the caveats and the error bars that are involved in those estimates and then we'll see a number of experiments that try to measure mixing in various parts of the water column and in various regions and then in the last lecture we'll try to go back and in a sense based on the new observations and the new evidence of what the abyssal circulation really looks like so whether these two arguments really um, we stood the test of time or they need to be somewhat revised in terms uh, uh, in view of the new uh, observational context that we have. So first we want to know what the deep ocean is and I'll start by giving an operational definition so we understand what we're talking about. This is a section across the Pacific Ocean. This is collected during the World Ocean Circulation Experiment in the 90s so it's a modern section. 
and we are looking at temperature. This is depth from the surface of the ocean down to, well, all the way to the ocean bottom in this section. P16 is just across the Pacific. This is around Antarctica, and it goes all the way to the Bering Strait to the north. And what you can see, well, first of all, the ocean is the ocean temperature, and it will be true also for density, but that has the additional component of salinity, but the ocean temperature is becoming colder as you move towards the ocean bottom. Even that argument, I guess nobody here is probably surprised to hear that, but until the chemists boil, oceanographers weren't even sure whether the ocean was getting warmer towards the bottom or colder. The argument was actually it was probably getting warmer because there was geothermal heating hitting the bottom, and there was not quite an understanding of how active fluids are in transporting heat, and so that they could redistribute heat, so a situation with warm waters at the bottom would be unstable. But in any case, that is something now we know, and uh, if you look at the changes in temperature with depth, you see that temperature line, the equator can get in excess of 25, 30 degrees. But by the time you get at 1,000 meters, the temperature is down to 4 degrees C. So you have a drop of more than 20 degrees, 25 degrees in the upper kilometer of the ocean. Below one kilometer, all the way to the ocean bottom, you go from 4 degrees to zero. So the ocean is much less stratified in this part of the water column than in the upper kilometer. So we're going to talk about the deep ocean as everything about below a kilometer as an operational definition is the part of the ocean that is much less weakly stratified. The reason why this part is strongly stratified is largely because it's exposed to uh, wind forcing. You're going to have uh, winds in, mid lat in low latitudes that create conversions that push water down, so you have warm water that gets pushed down and stacked and made very stratified. So another way you can think about this one kilometer as our operational definition is we are talking about the part of the ocean which is not directly experience wind forcing driven stratification. So whatever method sets the stratification there is a bit less obvious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For what we talk, you can probably think about uh, temperature as being potential temperature. Yeah, I repeat. So how uh, the potential temperature is related to actual temperature C? So in potential temperature is the temperature after you subtract compressive effects. As you go deeper, there is a compressive effect would make the temperature increase, but that is dynamically relevant. So here they subtract it. So the temperature, the potential temperature of zero degrees here at the bottom is actually the temperature of a parcel that was brought all the way up to the surface adiabatically, and that's the temperature you would have. So the ocean abyss is cold. The second thing that the ocean abyss is important, and I'm showing this picture because in a second I at least try to do my homework in response to the title of the meeting. I want to make a case why knowing something about the ocean is first of all important for climate, and second, it has a lot to do with turbulence. So the two topics are actually heavily involved in understanding this deep ocean, and the climate impact of this abyssal situation is best uh, illustrated by looking at the section of dissolved carbon in the ocean. And the higher values are in yellow, lower values are in blue. And you see that the abyssal ocean below 1,000 meters is most where most of the dissolved carbon sits. So if you want to know the partition of carbon between the ocean and the atmosphere, most of what you're talking about is carbon stored in the abyssal ocean. The amount of dissolved carbon in the abyssal ocean is 60 times larger than what is presently in the atmosphere, so it's a very large reservoir. The reason why it's so large, well, it's first because, as I just said, the deep ocean is cold, so you can dissolve more carbon in colder water. The reason why you could carbon put carbonated water in the fridge. The second reason is uh, more subtle. It has to do with uh, biology, and it's half of that signal. Um, there is photosynthesis at the top of the ocean that stores carbon in material cells uh, in various organisms, largely plankton, phytoplankton, and zooplankton. When these organisms die and dissolve, they precipitate, they are actually heavy. They precipitate in the deep ocean, they redissolve in the abyssal ocean, so there is what is called a biological pump. There is a transfer of carbon that depletes the upper ocean and replenishes the deep ocean. So most of the carbon is in the deep ocean. So from a climate perspective, you have this very strong, large reservoir of cold water in the abyss and a large reservoir of carbon in the abyss. There is a question. Uh, so they're sinking at both poles, but there seems to be high concentration in the north. Does that have to? Does that come from there's more industrial carbon dioxide in the north? No, so these signals are background signals, and uh, 
carbon uh, anthropogenic signals are very small compared to anything you're seeing here. Mm. This, I think, is a section in the Pacific, and it's, that it's the oldest water. The water sinks down here, and we are going to go through this argument. But the water sinks around Antarctica, come down here, then turn around and come back. So this is the oldest water that are most replenished of uh, organic carbon. If I showed the Atlantic, it wouldn't be as dramatic. So the deep ocean, in terms of thermal structure, is that part of the ocean that uh, is cold and stores large amount of carbon. And uh, this is not a new observation. I want to get to some arguments about security. It's not a new observation. It's something that goes back at least uh, to Henry Ellis in 1751, even though I found that there is also some um, discussion, again, by the chemist Boyle b before that. Uh, Boyle was reporting, it's interesting, it's again in terms of what you could publish at that time, said that the people of uh, trust told him that by diving at low latitudes close to the equator, when they were going order 100 meters below the sea surface, they realized the temperature was extremely cold, and by extremely cold they meant something that was colder than anything they experienced at the surface at those latitudes. Henry Ellis goes a bit beyond that. He's a captain on a slave trader, so he crosses the equator pretty often. And he was also, uh, I think, I don't think a professional scientist, but an amateur scientist, so he liked to conduct experiments as he was going on his vessels. And again, what he did, he did a bit more systematically, he tried to measure temperature by using a bucket that he would uh, lower in the water column. Then he had flaps so that he could close the bucket when they pull the water, the bucket of water up, and they would measure the temperature on the deck of the ship. And what he's telling us here is that when he goes, he noticed that the temperature kept decreasing down to, well, order a thousand meters below the surface. And below that, instead, it didn't seem to change all that much. The, measure, the temperature that he measured is 11 degrees Celsius down to a thousand meters. It's a bit higher than what we do today, but the problem was that he was lifting this bucket through warmer water, and so he was overestimating a bit the temperature. His conclusion was that the experiment, which seemed at first but mere food for curiosity, became in the interim very useful to us. By its means, we supplied our cold bath and cooled our wines or water at pleasure, which is vastly agreeable to us in this burning climate. <laughs> so it was useful. <laughs> the person that actually took it uh, realized that there was very important information in that simple observation is Benjamin Thompson, the reason that this water, I mean, now he had the numbers, and he realized that those waters was extremely cold. He said probably those waters were so cold that they never experienced temperature of that kind close to the equator at the surface, so they must come from higher latitudes. He claims that observing porridge, as he was cooking porridge, he realized there was this convective motion that actually heat can drive circulations in fluids, and so he suggested that probably what is being seen here is that you see this is his schematic. It's not his schematic. It's a schematic pr produced by Lenz a few years later, but it's based on the work of Benjamin Thompson. The idea was that if this is depth and this is latitude, here is your equator, southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere. You have sinking of water at high latitudes. And his claim was all the waters must come back up to the surface at low latitudes. So you're bringing all this cold water. And that's why Captain Ellis was seeing this cold water close to the surface. I think it's important to realize that Benjamin Thompson made quite an important leap in understanding problem because he realized, I mean, he got the part of sinking at high latitudes, as we'll see, essentially right. And even the part of upwelling along the equator, we'll see in a second, it wasn't really far off because he'd have observations to back it up. And in some sense, it will turn out that all the literature that we'll discuss today in the lectures to come have a lot to do that. The hard part of the problem is to understand how the upwelling occurs. The other part that was based on the observation he had was correct. There is sinking a high latitude. It's how the water comes back requires a bit more of a, uh, digging into the dynamics. And when I'm saying that uh, it turned out that people after Benjamin Thompson took this argument quite seriously. Is that if you look at the temperature section I've shown you before, you see when you're close to the equator, isopycna tend to bend towards the surface. So the argument at the point at the time was, well, this is all this cold water coming back up to the surface. You see that they push cold water towards the surface right around the equator. We now know that that argument doesn't hold. They couldn't know at that time because uh, this upwelling is generated by surface winds that generate a divergence uh, 
uh, of ocean currents at the equator and they push water outward so they suck water towards the surface but that is a very surface confined circulation it doesn't penetrate any deep uh, but at the time pictures like that that were generated by people like Captain Ellis and then uh, more uh, serious oceanographic cruises after that seem to support that argument I don't know if Bill will talk about it tomorrow that actually started a whole debate early on in the 1800 <laughs> between Kroll and Carpenter whether the ocean was driven by or powered by uh, thermal forcing here the claim would be that you're cooling water here and warming them there and so you have this convective cell a bit like in the atmosphere that was the argument that Benjamin Thompson proposed and Carpenter after him supported and Kroll that instead insisted that now the ocean must be really powered by winds at the surface the abyss must be stagnant and nothing should be happening that argument in the 1800 came back to us in the last 20 30 years where people are again arguing what really powers the overturning circulation but if we go a bit to modern times I try to convince you that indeed now we have better sections and we have better section in here I'm going to show section again from the world circulation experiment but already before and after sec World War II um, there are a number of uh, expedition with the famous research vessel the Challenger and the Meteor that do start sampling the water column and what you tend to see is we see that there is strong evidence for this sinking of water at high latitudes that fill the deep ocean we see also that there is no obvious evidence of water coming back to the surface as far we can tell if all we do is we take a section this is a section of a tracer in particular Salinini this is a section across the Pacific again the same section that you've seen before before I was showing temperature salinity is a weaker it impacts less strongly the density so you can try to look at it this in section like this a bit like a passive tracer and what you see is that there is a plume of high salinity water that seems to come from this again is depth and this is the whole section from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere and you see this plume of salinity that seems to intrude in the deep ocean this is a signature of convection happening in the southern hemisphere and filling the ocean interior what you don't see is this plume coming back towards the surface so there isn't any obvious evidence of the water coming back or at least it tells you that that tracer doesn't really provide a strong signature for that if you look at the same section in the Atlantic now instead of the Pacific and again depth now this is again Antarctica but now we are going to the Nordic Sea in the North Atlantic we are again plotting salinity now what you see that there seems to be a plume that stems from the northern hemisphere and floods the ocean at least at depths of around 2000 meters or so this is a high salinity plume and then you also see some signature of a lower salinity plume then instead that connect to the southern hemisphere around Antarctica and floods the ocean at deeper depth than the other one so again now you see signature of formation of water in two positions one is in the northern latitudes of the North Atlantic and again around Antarctica but again you don't see any obvious signature of salinity plumes coming straight up towards the ocean column the inference at that point was that clearly we do see formation of this dense water consistent with the argument of Benjamin Thompson probably water really come back deep in the ocean at high latitudes that is yeah C c can I ask before uh, a very naive question I mean can you explain why uh, the, it the, the, the water are more salty in the north than in the south in the Atlantic and uh, maybe it's different in the Pacific yes so well this is something a proper Paula will get much more in okay no they are different sorry so they are very different so the salinity of this water is the same in the Atlantic and the Pacific this one instead is much saltier the reason why that is much saltier has to do with the convective process of duck in the North Atlantic then the surface water that come back have already larger salinity to start with on top of it there is some intrusion of salinity possibly from the Mediterranean Sea so that water at the starting place has a higher salinity so it carries that signature in the ocean interior around Antarctica um, waters are less salty to start with they are still saltier than the surface water but they are less salty than what happens in the North Atlantic so they carry their signature so here we are really using it mostly as a tracer that has some surface value that depends on the property of convection 
So there is a big difference in salinity between uh, Atlantic the Atlantic and the Pacific. The Atlantic overall is much saltier than the Pacific in the north, where you see it here. Also, the surface, because of Mediterranean, well, not the surface, up to a thousand meters, it's quite a bit saltier. But even at the surface, if you swim, you can tell the difference. If you go to the Pacific. <laughs> so why does this matter for climate? Do you want to say anything else? I know. No, no, I saw that. Um, so why does this matter for climate? And we just want to make a bit of a point. Why is it important on a large scale? Is that, as it turns out, this deep ocean is both a reservoir, we said, of cold waters, but it's a very large volume. It stores can store a lot of heat, and we said it's a very large reservoir of carbon. If we are looking at, if we look at maps of now changes on uh, of deep temperatures in the last, this is a picture from 2010 from Durak and Weitfeld. Uh, we're looking at degree C changes per 50 year in the 50 years prior to when the paper was published. And what you see now, so it's the change in temperature. This is typically warm in most of the oceans. So it means that the ocean was getting warmer over that time period. Uh, they're using only the last 50 years because that's where they have at least enough data and they plot the signal only down to 1500 meters because they have enough profile over that depth to actually produce a map of that kind. But what you start seeing, of course, the largest temperature increase is very close to the surface in a very thin layer close to the surface, the one directly experiencing warming temperatures in the atmosphere. But the other two signals that you start seeing is that there is a plume of warm water that seems to come in the ocean interior. This is a zonally average map of uh, both ocean basins, but you do see this is the Atlantic effect. And then you see a lot of heat propagating down to below a thousand meters around Antarctica. This is a signature again of this deep circulation, which is start taking some of this anthropogenic signal into the deep ocean. And we know that the ocean as of today is already taking up 90% of the excess heat budget, heat that the atmosphere is receiving. If we wait a very long time, indeed most of the excess heat that is going to be captured by the ocean will end up in the abyssal ocean. So if you want to make a prediction on time span of a thousand years or so, all the heat will end up in the deep ocean and the rate at which is uptaken will depend on the stratification and circulation of that abyssal ocean. The second thing you can look at is now the anthropogenic carbon. I don't remember who asked the question about whether the picture I showed before was uh, uh, total carbon, just anthropogenic. Before it was the food, the soil carbon. Now this is trying to instead just uh, show the anthropogenic components of the change in carbon stored in the abyss because anthropogen of anthropogenic signals. This is from Sabine et al. in 2004. Uh, so this is the change compared to pre-industrial time, supposedly. This is depth again, latitude. This is a section in the Atlantic from again uh, around Antarctica to the northern hemisphere. And again, the point the only point I want to make is, again, you see these plumes of high anthropogenic carbon entering into the deep ocean in the high latitudes of the North Atlantic and in the low latitudes around Antarctica. So again, also carbon is flooding the deep ocean from high latitudes and in the long term, all the carbon that we are emitting in the atmosphere, if we stop the emission today, will not find its way all the way to the abyssal ocean before on even longer time scale it gets subducted in the crust and disappears. But so the deep ocean is even in terms of the response on uh, hundreds to thousands of years, the response to um, climate change or changes in the atmospheric radiative budget, it also gets transferred both in terms of heat and in terms of carbon into the abyssal ocean. So it's important to know what is that rate of circulation in order to be a bit specific about what these time scales actually are. So if we, if we look at just these two pictures, can we deduce that uh, the, the time for the water to go down from the uh, North Atlantic or South Atlantic I is about a decade using this uh, anthropogenic signal? Uh, you could try. Actually, there is a better way to do it, which is using SFC uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Then you can really see they're easier to measure temperature you already have to take difference between two signals instead of SF6. We know when we started injecting them and then you can start following their history in time. And in the convective region, you start seeing this plume coming down pretty rapidly. So it's decadal time scale. And then it takes longer. You see that this both these two signals are mostly vertical. It will take a while before the horizontal circulation transport that signal in the ocean interior. We expect the signal to enter in the Atlantic on time scale of decades to 50 to 100 years, while in the Pacific it will be at least an order of magnitude longer because that circulation is even slower. 
So the first thing I want to review quickly at this point is uh, we mentioned that there is sinking at high latitudes. You do have tracer signatures of it, even in terms of perturbation on short time scale, we see this sinking at high latitudes. So that seems to happen. The only question we might have is um, why does it happen only at high latitudes? And it might seem a silly question to us, but I'll show you in a second it's not, because that's probably not where you would expect if you only took surface flux measurement and you see where the ocean is being cooled. It's not where the ocean, the sinking doesn't happen where the ocean is being cooled most. And you can start thinking about why. But all I want to make the point is that we do understand, however, where the sinking occurs and why it's so localized in a few places. Instead, the rest of the lectures, as I said, we'll be trying to understand how this water comes back up because we don't have any direct observation from any of those trays that I've shown you before that suggest that that water is coming out in some special place. So this is a map. Now it's a surface map, so now this is latitude and longitude. We're looking at the ocean from the top. Um, and you're looking at the, it's the density flux. Think about the heat flux, except that we are also accounting for the f effect of salinity. Right? So it's where the ocean is made dense. And where it's dark means that you're making the ocean very dense, or you're cooling it substantially. And you see that that tends to happen in what are called western boundary currents. These are currents that flow along the continent. They are pretty fast, and they bring warm water from the south to the north, or from the equator to the pole. So you have this warm ocean under cold atmosphere, and the ocean loses a lot of heat. So you see that the big bullseyes are around what is called the Gulf Stream and the Kuroshio current. Also in the southern hemisphere, you have the Agulhas current, all these boundary currents that tend to transport warm currents under cold atmosphere. And that's where you have a lot of heat loss. But that's not where the convection actually occurs. We said that the convection occurs really far north in the North Atlantic, or I'll show you in a second where, and around Antarctica, where the heat fluxes are not as large. But it turns out that you need two things for <laughs> convection to penetrate very deep, because we're asking the question of what part of the surface ocean, what areas of the surface ocean are able to create convection that penetrates deep at least below a thousand meters. And for that to occur, you also need to be in a region where the stratification is sufficiently weak. What I mean is that if I have for the same heat loss at the ocean surface, if I have a very stratified ocean and apply this heat loss for just a winter, well, the water will get cold, but since it's very strongly stratified, it will reach its neutron buoyant level pretty fast. It will not sink very deep. Instead, if the stratification is very weak or in the limit of no stratification, that water would plunge all the way to the ocean bottom. And we've already seen the picture before. If I show you a picture of the ocean stratification, now it's a zonal average across the whole ocean. It's again depth, southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere. You remember I said the low latitudes or mid-latitudes, well, what we call the subtropics. You have very strong stratification because the winds create a convergence that push warm water into the ocean and creates a very strong stratification. That's where most of the west western boundary current are. So you have a lot of heat loss in those regions, but you also have very strong stratification that impedes the convection to penetrate very deep. You're going to have a very strong modulation of what is called the surface mix layer. You do have convection every winter, but it just penetrates a few hundred meters below the surface and then it stops because it can't penetrate deep. Instead, at high latitudes, you have uh, wind divergence. The winds are creating a divergence of the ocean surface. They bring cold water towards the surface already. So the stratification to start with is much weaker. Now with some cooling, you can penetrate very deep below a thousand meters. So actually if you look at where convection occurs, now you start realizing these are these dots are places where we know that deep convection uh, is observed in the deep ocean. And Around Antarctica is two places, around the Weddell Sea and the Ross Sea, and the North Atlantic is the Labrador Sea and the Greenland Sea. And now you see that these are a few places where there is clearly some heat loss, but it's just at high latitudes where the stratification is weak enough that the convection can penetrate very deep. When you say f a few places, uh, how big are the places? Oh, oh how big? Well, it's the full Weddell Sea. I don't know what it is. must be a thousand kilometers across. So they are substantial areas, but they are very limited in aerial extent compared to the global ocean. And that starts explaining you why you do see a signature in Tracer, because it's a sufficiently localized region that I can follow a plume of water as it sinks in the ocean abyss. If it was a very diffusive process, as we probably are going to infer for the upwelling, then it's a very slow process and it takes a long time. So I lose any signature in Tracer because they move too quickly. So the reason is 
I think what is important is mostly they are sufficiently localized that this convection can penetrate all the way to the deep ocean and keep its signature with itself. If it was a much larger area, you would probably have too much entrainment to ever really follow that trace. It would lose its signature before it gets to the abyss. So, uh, uh, it's, a na it's naive again, but is, is the stratification weak because there is convection, or is there convection because the stratification is weak? It's a bit of both, but clearly the wind are setting the background condition for the stratification occur because indeed I will contend that you see here there is a much stronger heat loss. Despite that, you don't convect very deep, so th the stratification really is impeding convection there. I would contend that here it's not that the weak stratification is what drives the convection, but it provides the background state such that convection can uh, penetrate very deep. So if you change the wind patterns, you could stop convection at high latitude. Excuse me, is the convection uh, persistent? Is it constant in time? No, it's mostly in winter when you have most of the heat loss. That said, it's not measured that accurately uh, in the sense that uh, it's very hard to go in this region. Well, in the Northern Hemisphere now, it's reasonably well observed. It's actually interesting that convection itself is very seasonal. But then when you look at the water flooding in the ocean interior, that seems to have much less of a time dependence, so there is a rectification in the ocean interior, which I don't think is well understood, but it's very well detailed for the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, you don't have many brave people that want to really spend long times in winter there, so the observation of winter convection is much more limited. Uh, do we understand why it's so localized? Like why there's no sinking in the, in the northern Pacific? Or anywhere else in the southern so that gets us in a completely different set of lectures. I don't know, will Paolo talk at all about that? Not really. Um, there is, as we said, there is an asymmetry that I think Paolo will talk about in terms of the distribution of salinity between the two hemispheres. This water ends up, there is an exchange of salt that is taken out of the Pacific and brought in into the Atlantic by, the again, the overturning circulation. And so this water are already salted, which is, again, a preconditioning. It's water that starts already being a bit denser, so it is easier to get deep convect. The other obvious thing is that the Pacific extends less in latitude, in northern latitude, than the Atlantic. So this is also exposed to stronger forcing. So you start getting into asymmetries in the two basins. The reason why you have convection localized in the uh, around Antarctica, and it's a bit easier to understand Th these two regions. Well, in this map, unfortunately, they cut Antarctica out. Otherwise, you would see that Antarctica has two big indentations here. This is where you s the winds can actually act and create the strong divergence that we said is essential for the convection to occur. There are two gyres here, also polar gyre, where you get density surface brought all the way up to the surface by the winds while here you don't have as much of an indentation in the Antarctic continent, so you have much less so. So I think this is a bit easier to understand, that one, that asymmetry. It's something that I think people are finally getting a bit more confident about, but still not a settled issue. And it's not even clear that that asymmetry persists across different climates. There are arguments that suggest that convection in the northern latitude of the North Atlantic has stopped, um, at least during phases of the last uh, ice age, and times when the Pacific northern latitude turn on convection. So it's a present state statement. Uh, signaling. Uh, the question is, why is there a strong signal in the, su in the Indian Ocean? But I don't know signaling what. So this, there is again a western boundary. Uh, in e this is an eastern boundary current, but it's again a warm current. But these are all very surface signatures. So everything you look, 40 degrees and poleward of it has very little to do with convection at high latitudes. But yes, there are patterns. So now we get more in the topic of uh, the lecture, which is we at least understand, maybe a I should be careful by saying understand the convection, but at least we have very clear evidence that convection is very localized at high latitudes. Um, there are direct observations done now with direct profiling at those uh, locations, but also the tracer that gives you the signature. But so far we haven't seen any evidence of water coming back to the surface. That said, we believe in mass conservation, so if the water comes in at some point, somewhere it has to come up. 
And that was something that Henry Stallman started thinking seriously about and working in collaboration with Aaron's in particular. He did publish a number of papers. And the first thing they decided to see, or at least the way I see, if you read the papers, the real first question they had was, is there any signature of that upwelling? Can we actually pr provide any indirect way to measure where that upwelling is occurring? Um, just to set the problem straight, so they decided to think about the problem in this way. So this is our surface ocean, this is the abyss, uh, this is the bottom of the ocean, this is the north, let's say North Pole and the equator, if you're thinking about an Atlantic kind of situation, then we have sinking water at high latitudes, that's what we know, it's very localized. And he said the first thing is that, well, let's draw also a line, this is our thermocline line, this is a kilometer below the surface, and he said, well, if there is water coming in here, it has to upwell, we know that it has to come back, and if we don't know anything about where it comes back, it means that it's not localized, or not as localized as the sinking, otherwise we would have some signature of um, upwelling as much as we have of sinking, and so he said, the next obvious simplest approximation is to assume that the upwelling is uniform everywhere. Um, then you can do a calculation and say if the, the upwelling through this one kilometer surface is some constant W0, we can ask how large is W0 and is that a velocity that we could observe or not, just as a sanity check. And now we know, so if we want to know W0, we can estimate the amount of water that is sinking at high latitudes and divide by the whole area of the ocean, that is the vertical velocity across that surface. If we think about, well, here I took a number of 15 Sverdrup, so let's maybe say it's the Pacific. If it's 15 Sverdrup and we divide by the area of the Pacific, you get that the velocity of water upwelling through that surface has to be of the order of 10 to the minus 7 meters per second, which is of order of 3 meters per year. That's an incredibly small velocity, so I would tell you, yes, I would probably never observe anything like that. Tracer would not carry a signal of that kind. I can't observe it mostly because we know that even an internal wave field, just oscillation due to internal waves, are many orders of magnitude larger than that. So if you take any profile, the vertical velocity observed is due to this additional noise. You would have to average over centuries before you get that small residual. So at face value, clearly you wouldn't be able to observe directly that velocity, even though it might be present there all the time. So Henry Stallman decided to move a bit beyond and see whether there was anything that he could predict based on the assumption that there was that uniform upwelling velocity everywhere in the ocean, and whether he, he could make some prediction based on that assumption of uniform upwelling on what impacts it might have, for example, on the horizontal circulation, which is what he's going to describe next. And he said that he wanted to start simple. He knew that ocean circulation in the horizontal was also pretty weak. So he assumed that he could make what is called the geostrophic approximation, where the pressure gradient forces are just balanced by um, the Coriolis acceleration. In the full momentum equation, you would have also non-inertial term, but for a small Rossby number, that's a sensible approximation to start with. And he assumed that friction or other processes is thinking mostly about circulation in the abyss away from boundaries or anything, so it's probably small. And to keep things simple, we just assume that we make the beta plane approximation. We assume that the rotation, that rotation of the Earth vertical to the position we are looking at is some constant plus a linear function of y. Stommel didn't make that approximation and just to keep things simple. But there is a change in rotation rate with latitude because the sphere, the Earth is a sphere, so the vertical component of f of the curvature acceleration changes, and then. He said, the other th only other thing I need is to assume mass conservation, which seems fair enough. In a sense, this would be what is known as the planetary geostrophic system if I also wrote the equation for density or the equation for buoyancy or for temperature, if you only consider temperature. We'll see in a second that Stommer doesn't consider that. That will be brought in by Walter Monk, the second paper that we are going to discuss. So in a sense, you can think in the back of your mind that what they really are using is some planetary geostrophic system. For the moment, we are only using the momentum budget. From these equations, Stommer proposed to take um, the vorticity equation. So what you do, you take a d dy of the first equation and d dx of the second equation, and you subtract them from each other so that the pressure force, which is a gradient since you've taken the curve, vanishes, and then you get, I don't know, maybe I can write it, I'm going to get an f ux plus vy. Now I had to be careful because 
dF itself depends on y, so when I take the dDy here, I also get a term which is this beta, which is dF dy times v equal to zero. So this is my vorticity equation that I written here. And now I use the mass conservation statement that tells me that the horizontal divergence is just equal to minus the vertical divergence of w, so I get the statement that beta v is equal to f dw dz. Right? So now it's telling me that there is that if there is a divergence in the vertical velocity, I can have uh, a meridional flow in this system. This, by the way, for the oceanographer in the room or whoever took a class in oceanography, is essentially Sverdrup's argument for the wind-driven part of the circulation, where this divergence is generally generated by winds. We see here that Stoma is using the same argument now to try to understand the deep ocean circulation. And let's first see what we can do with the math and then we interpret these results. He said, well, I could integrate in this equation now in the vertical if I assume I have a flat bottom and I'm integrating all the way up to this one kilometer depth, which I use as the top of the abyssal ocean. When I take that integral, I get a beta VH, where now V here would be just the vertical integral. Essentially, maybe I should have written it as beta capital V, the total transport, is equal to F. And now I have to integrate the WDZ at the top, the WDZ, if I integrate the WDZ, I get the W at the top, which is my W naught, minus the W at the bottom for a flat bottom, W at the bottom, there is no normal flow through the boundary, is zero. So this was the result that Stommel gets, that as long as, well, if I'm in the northern hemisphere where F is positive and W naught, we know is positive, we are assuming uniform upwelling because it's balanced in this localized region of Dan Dwelling, so this is a positive term, that implies that there is a poleward flow in the northern hemisphere. If I'm in the southern hemisphere, F is negative, then again, V is negative, means again a poleward flow in the southern hemisphere. Henry Stoneman, when they got this result, was so surprised that didn't quite believe it, if you read the paper in itself, because what he's suggesting is that I had convection at high latitudes, right? We said that the convection is at the highest latitude you could uh, see in the ocean, and his prediction was that there would be a flow that goes towards the source the of convection. The flow is not going away from the convecting region, you're actually bringing more water towards where it's sinking. At the time, now, I don't know, there are people in the audience that have the right age to tell me whether that was the reason. I guess today what you would do, the next thing is that you would go to a numerical model and try to simulate the equation and see whether you've done something wrong or there is something funny you forgot about. At the time, instead they decided to go to the laboratory and they've done a number of laboratory experiments to actually show that indeed, if you take sector models, but just we'll see some solution in a second, you do indeed drive this flow towards the source region that was sufficiently surprising for them that it took a while to really believe that they were accurate. And so there is a third person that is involved in this work between beyond Stommel and Aarons, that is Faller, that was the laboratory person that set up these experiments. Yeah. Why is it non-obvious that uh, you would have a flow towards the convecting regions? Because by mass conservation, that's what you would expect. No? Well, I drive some convection, he expected to find, it's in the abyss, right? So the thing that he said there is water convecting here and now he's finding out that the water in the abyss is moving towards that sinking region. There is also some upwelling that is balancing that. So when I average over the full ocean is true, but in the horizontal I get that the abyss is moving water towards the source region. That didn't seem intuitive. <laughs> and if you're a good scientist when it's non intuitive you want to make sure you haven't forgot something obvious before you publish it. And because I always wonder that if you look, there is a speculation paper by Henry Stone where he makes the argument. Then after that, there are a few papers that are only a uh, laboratory experiment to try to make the claim that indeed those solutions are correct. And then he goes back to the ocean and he finally publishes what he thinks the abyssal situation might look. And I think that intermediate step was to convince himself that um, they weren't missing something uh, obvious. Now, to understand the solution, you can really think that what this stretching of water column, you have upwelling, oh, there is a question. Yeah, so I was wondering if you integrate the equation all the way to the surface, um, you get zero on the right hand side. So does it mean that you have a current in the opposite direction in the? Well, I mean, uh, well, if you don't have any upwelling at the surface, of course you're not driving any circulation, right? Because well, I go to the actual surface of the ocean. Or 
W Sorry? equal. I go if I go all the way to the actual surface of the ocean, yeah. where W equals zero. So you don't drive any circulation. This vanishes because zero minus zero is zero, and beta V is equal to zero, which indeed. Sorry. So, so V is going in the other direction in the upper ocean. Is that? Ah, that. If you look at what is happening, yes. Well, yes, except that the upper ocean is also wind driven. So, but this part, you're well. Yes and no. We'll see that a large part of the conservation of this problem is going to be also in the horizontal circulation. Now I have to worry about that I solved only part of the problem. There, is, there are going to be boundary currents that still affect the mass balance. Basil, you're right. If, if you had a situation where there was just a source of convection, l never mind how that is generated, but you know you can always put a pump that does that. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's a purely baroclinic circulation, so what's happening in the upper layer is opposite to what is happening, yes. Yeah, but you're doing the same problem in the upper layer. If I say that there is, if I just integrate across this equation, I get the same equation, so yes. Yeah. What this equation, however, really tells me is that this stretching is really, I have a, a water column. If I think about my water column between the ocean bottom and the top of the ocean and my one kilometer surface, it has some planetary rotation rate because it's rotating with the um, ocean itself. I'm stretching it, so it's like a ballerina. I want to increase its axis or its spin around its axis. It could do it by just spinning faster around itself like a ballerina when it closes its hands and starts spinning because it reduces its angular momentum. But um, this is an inertial effect that I neglected here. The other way a water column in the Earth can increase its rotation rate is by moving fa closer to the axis of rotation of the Earth, which means moving poleward with the ocean. So what we are seeing here is just that conservation of angular momentum tells me that for that water column it has to move poleward in order to conserve its um, angular momentum because it's being stretched. And that is the physics behind this argument. Now, you could say, well, I've already learned something quite important. Now, can I actually observe this horizontal circulation? Because the whole point that uh, Henry Stoneman wanted to build was to find some observational evidence for that upwelling that seems to be so fundamental for the overturning circulation. And at the scaling level, we can see that now we have this solution. So V itself is equal to F over beta, W naught over H. If I take F and beta as mid-latitude value, so F is 10 to the minus 4 second to the minus 1 beta, same something close to 2 times 10 to the minus 11 per meter per second. The W naught we estimated before, it's order of 10 to the minus 7 meters per second if I assume it's uniform. H is about 3 kilometers. If I go from 1 kilometer, the base of the thermocline, all the way to the average depth of the ocean, which is 4 kilometer, you get something which is order of 2 times 10 to the minus 4 meter per second, which is 3 order of magnitude larger than what we've seen before, but it's still 0 0.2 millimeter per second. And I guess Bill has already shown picture of sea surface velocities, but even in the deep ocean, you see that there is a lot of geostrophic turbulence, lateral motion, that have velocity that are order of centimeters per second in the deep ocean. Wi sorry? And tides, <laughs> which are two orders of magnitude larger than that number. So again, actually seeing that circulation would require incredibly long averaging time in the very deep ocean, which means putting instruments that live for decades in the deep ocean, that's very hard. So again, by itself, predicting this polar flow wasn't sufficient to make any obvious observational con connection to direct observations. So here now, Stommel, who had already solved the wind-driven circulation, so he's just borrowing on the work he has already done, and so he knows where it's going to go, realize that now if I look at the picture from the top and we are going to consider a closed basin, which is something that you should all keep in mind. It's interesting that the whole literature on the abyssal circulation, at least until the 90s, uh, is largely confined uh, to closed boxes, even though we insisted that the, high the convection at high latitude definitely happens at high, and the convection happens at high latitudes. One of the two high latitudes being a southern ocean, which is clearly not a closed box. But for quite a while, that line of evidence was considered not particularly relevant. So we are going to consider a closed box. And we said that, let's say that this is north and this is south. And we're looking at the northern hemisphere. So we have a polar flow going north. 
and we assume that there is some sinking region of water coming down here and we know that this I'm only looking at the circulation below a thousand meters so there is some upwelling uniformly distributed over this whole region that balances that sinking now what Stommel argued what he realized and he knew at that point is that the solution is clearly not complete because I have water coming across this latitude in the northern latitude plus I have some sinking there is some upwelling here, fair enough, but it's definitely smaller than the amount of sinking because the upwelling is redistributed over the whole ocean. So now there is too much water entering in this box. That water has to come out somewhere. So I haven't finished my solution, or it's not a complete solution for that box. And Stoneman realized that indeed there is some problem in this equation that can't be complete because once I solve for my V from the vorticity equation, I have a full solution for V given external forcing. So these are external parameters. I could plug it back in here. Now I can integrate the pressure equation just by integrating in X. And if I integrate in X my function, now I have a P as a function of X and Y, and I could plug it back in here and get the full, full solution for U. So I have a solution for U and V. But the problem I have is that my pressure is this equation is a first order differential equation so I could prescribe my boundary condition for example on the right hand side if I want to start there and integrate P starting from the right hand side and I what do I say along this boundary well I know that I don't want to have any normal flow across that boundary so P should be independent of Y so it should be a constant along this boundary because if P is independent of Y U is zero across this boundary so I could integrate my P from here starting from zero and I go all the way to the western boundary but when I get to the western boundary my pressure doesn't go back to a constant necessarily because it depends on what is the structure of F and F is latitude dependent so I don't match the second boundary condition I could then decide that I start integrating from the western boundary and move all the way to the eastern boundary but again I match this boundary condition but not the other one I really have a problem and this is a first order differential equation I want to satisfy two boundary conditions so that tells me that this system is not complete and what it really what really happens is that you need to include the boundary layer correction to the solution which will drive some flow and we can start assuming that it's on the western boundary we've seen the second y has to be on the western boundary but there has to be some flow that come down and that flow is probably strong enough that this small Rossby number approximation is not quite correct so there is a correction where the physics is a bit different um, if we put our western our boundary current on the west the kind of solution if i draw streamlines here they're going to look something like this So you see this very strong return flow along the western boundary and all this northward going flow in the interior and I create a very strong or a large scale cyclonic circulation. Now that solution seems to make sense because you remember that we were stretching water columns, we were putting positive vortices into the system. If I assume that I want that system to get into an equilibrium state, one thing I could assume is that there is this big circulation that develops and there is some friction at the bottom that slows it down so there is a forcing by the stretching and some friction at the bottom that slows it down the two balance each other and I can get an equilibrium solution so that solution physically at least seems consistent you could try to put the return flow on the other boundary and I don't know I assume that probably most of you have seen this argument because it's the argument that describes the western intensification of wind driven current in the ocean it's just repeated for the abyssal ocean but if there is anybody who hasn't seen it you can start thinking about it if I put my return current on the eastern boundary I would get the circulation of this kind which is now anticyclonic and without going into details and if there are pop people that want to go into details we can go into details after the lecture now I generate an anticyclonic circulation which requires a pretty awkward kind of friction because I'm putting positive vortices into the system and somehow that friction must be such that it pushes me in the opposite direction so they get the solution in the other direction so it turns out that this is not physically plausible and this is the kind of solution that you can get so what Stommel posited is that he didn't even have to solve the problem in terms of the detail of the dynamics of the boundary current all he had to do was to realize he had to conserve mass and so that the solution of the full problem must have some interior transport ti this is what we just derived is this velocity times h times lx or 
this meridional transport across the whole section. There is the source of water from the top. As we said, there is some upwelling in this region, and then there has to be a return flow along the western boundary that closes the mass budget. And therefore, the transport along that western boundary current might be equal to the source as not plus Ti, this is the other source of water in that box, minus Tu is the upwelling of water over this whole area, up to a latitude y, choose the latitude y you want. So that is an estimate for what is the transport in that western boundary current. Okay, so he had an argument, he had all the pieces, now the mass budget is closed. Now, the point that he wanted to make is, is how strong is that? Western boundary current, can I at least measure that? We already failed to measure the vertical velocity, to measure the meridional velocity in the interior. Maybe this western boundary current is an intensified effect. It might be a bit stronger. And just to give you some scaling argument, if we take some latitude y, it can be any latitude you want, we know that this is the transport. This I'm just writing the equation I had up here. But now we know it's not minus Tu, so the amount of water entering through sinking minus the upwelling, well, that's definitely a positive volume because it's not this balanced by upwelling averaging over the whole area. If I go up to here, I'm only averaging over half of the domain. So it's not must be larger than Tu. So this whole section, this whole set of terms, but definitely be larger than this uh, interior transport, right? So now I can give you an estimate for, in a very simplified fashion of what that western boundary transport might be because if I say that Tw has to be equal, but greater or equal than Ti and I have an estimate for Ti, the transport, Tw is going to be equal to the velocity along that western boundary current times the depth of that ocean times the width of that boundary current which we're going to call Lw and we said that that has to be greater than equal than Ti, the transport in the interior, which is just Vi times H times essentially the width of the basin. The boundary current is going to be very thin compared to the whole width of the basin, so we're going to call it Lx, the full width of the basin, essentially. So that, simplifying, it tells me that the velocity in the western boundary current must be greater than or equal than Vi, the velocity in the interior, times Lx over Lw. So now the question was, what is this ratio? So this is the width of the full basin, so it's of order 10,000 kilometers. We're thinking about the Pacific, but that kind of order of magnitude. We're not going to go into any detail. The other question is, what is the width of the boundary current? Observationally, at least for present purposes, not to go into too much detail, width of this boundary current are or the order of 100 kilometers or so. So this ratio is order of 100. So now all of a sudden, and this should have an eye, this ratio is order of 100. You remember that we had a velocity in the interior that was of order of 2 millimeters a second, but if I multiply by 100, now I get a velocity is 2 centimeters a second. Now, finally, I have a velocity which is of an order of magnitude that could be measured by putting instruments in the deep water column and actually be estimated. So the claim here was that there is an indirect way of estimating the upwelling of water to the ocean if there is actually that upwelling, and it is to observe whether there are intensified western boundary current in the ocean abyss. Yeah. Is there some way uh, to theoretically constrain that ratio, uh, Lx to Lw? Or there are arguments for what is the width of that boundary current. You can use frictional arguments, which are not particularly robust, of the inertial argument that tell you what that scale has to be. So, order 100 kilometers. Well, we could discuss it this afternoon. Um, so now the question was, do you actually observe it? Because now there was a clear prediction. There wasn't... <laughs> there is a very interesting debate, especially if you go to Woodsall, where all this unfolded in the 50s. At the time, I don't think there were any direct observations. It's pretty clear that there was no direct observation of Western Boundary Current, even though people had seen now tracer signature of something along western boundary again you see salinity anomalies propagating along western boundary so while stommel made the prediction of a current and especially gave a number of how strong that current should be that was new and people went and tried to verify it at the same time stommel also apparently knew a bit that there was good possibility that there were best boundary currents but 
the folklore is that this is the only major piece of theoretical oceanography that made a prediction that was later verified with observation, not the other way around. So okay, this is just the schematic of the circulation that Stommel has in mind. Stommel tries also at this point, after making this prediction, to draw a bit what he, would th he thought the global overturning circulation should be. So here we are he's just drawing a schematic on realistic topography. So when modelers are blamed for using realistic topography and then put their solutions on the realistic topography, and though that's not what they use, Stommel started doing it even before them. <laughs> But you see that what he's drawing is this overturning circulation with water moving poleward in the interior of each basin. And now he says, all I need to do to close that circulation and figure out how mu which way the western boundary current have to go. They always have to be on the west. And I just have to keep track of the mass balance. In a place like the Pacific is pretty straightforward. There is only a source of water in the southern hemisphere. In the present day climate, there is no source of water in the northern hemisphere, so water has to flow along a boundary current pretty much all the way to the north, except in the last piece where the water starts folding back and it comes back. In the Atlantic, you have the opposite situation. You have mostly the s dense water from the in the North Atlantic, so you have western boundary current going all the way across the equator and some of it coming north from the other direction. Same from the Indian Ocean, you have what then the current flowing northward because there is only a sink source around Antarctica, but not in the northern parts of the Indian Ocean. So there were predictions at least of, of the direction of this western boundary current. And so the first thing that happens after Stommer produces this kind of pictures is Swallow and Worthington decide to deploy some floats, some new really buoyant floats, just some floats that would follow the ocean current, and see if they put them uh, on the western boundary of George's Bank in the Atlantic, whether they actually tend to move uh, southward. And I still find it pretty impressive that they got away. This is publishing Nature, but maybe Nature would still publish it today because the claim they made was big. But it's based on nine floats. They deploy nine floats. They measure their trajectory between one and four days. And they mostly write that the floats move in the and maybe I can show you the next picture, then we finish reading, just to see where we are. This is George's Bank. This is the Gulf Stream. This is the surface wind-driven circulation that is bringing this warm water north. And the prediction was that there should be this deep western boundary current just along the western boundary moving southwestward. And indeed, they do see that the floats move uh, in the southwest direction, most of them, it turns out it's actually seven out of nine, which is pretty good, but <laughs> it's seven out of nine for four days, which is barely subinertial if you think about it. They want the mean geostrophic current, there are clearly internal waves and other motions on top of it, but that's what they could do. And more importantly, their velocity are of order of, I mean, some are between two and six centimeters a second, some are nine to five centimeters a second, but the order of magnitude seemed to be consistent with the argument that Stommel had proposed. So this is at least the beginning, the vindication for the existence of a western boundary current, even though at the moment I would contend it was pretty scant, but it has definitely been verified. So this was the picture I was showing you before. Now this is a section measured much more recently in 2004 by Fritz Schott. This is depth, and this is a section from uh, George's Bank, cutting across George's Bank. It's just it's off the U.S. coast, and it's a pretty shallow region, so it's just off the continental shelf, and this velocity is the velocity normal to the green region. And uh, what you see is now velocity, red means it's velocity going northward, so there is very, s very strong velocity up, to velocity up to 80 centimeters a second. This is the wind-driven circulation at the surface and this very strong warm current. But if you look below, you get also this blue velocity, this is 40 centimeters a second going northward, sorry, southward and it's the western boundary current that Stommel had predicted. Those velocities persistent um, in the deep ocean are very large compared to typical velocity, persistent velocity in the deep ocean, so it's a strong signal. I mean, if I m took the section and I started moving in the ocean interior, you generally get close to zero, and you can't tell even which direction the flows are going. So the western boundary current or deep western boundary current at the time were quite a surprise because people thought that the abyssal ocean was probably pretty creation, instead there are strong signals. And so my argument, in a sense, was, well, the fact that there are this western boundary current means that there is some force in somewhere, and he contended that forcing was the stretching of water columns by the abyssal upwelling of waters. So you, you, you have been a bit fast at uh, uh, s explaining why the uh, 
we have a western boundary current rather than yeah. eastern one. Can you explain in a few words? I mean, the I can. Um, depends how much people follow. I mean, one way to think about it, at least the simple way I can think about it, is that this set of equation, as we said, was not complete. Um, the simplest way to at least understand if I want to have a closed system is that I need to add some friction to my problem. Right, so now I pose this force into some stretching water columns, but I also allow some friction to let the system equilibrate, otherwise this flow will keep accelerating. So now if I have some friction, when I solve my full equation of motion, I don't have it anymore, I have the beta V, F, W, Z, but now I get also terms from my frictional terms, which are now a negative force. So now there is a spin down of the circulation or a sink of vorticity, which I didn't have before. Now, since the boundary current developed only on the eastern side, let's forget about derivatives in y that are going to be weak. It's mostly next that we had the problem, the return flow was on the western boundary current. Now you see that along the boundary, this term Vx can become very large. everybody with that can become very large because derivative we said that we are squeezing the boundary current along this section um, so this term in the in the interior we have a leading order balance between the terms we mentioned before but in the boundary we can have a leading order balance between my meridional velocity and the frictional term and now you find out that if the frictional term has a minus r sign, you can just solve this now first order equation. It tells you that v has to decay away from the boundary, and it decays away only if you start from this direction because the solution has a minus beta over r. If I put from this direction, I would have a velocity that increase exponentially away from the boundary. So is this argument robust with respect to the dissipation mechanism? It's what? Is it robust? You have used the linear friction. I mean, is it robust with respect to this? No, you can use any friction as long as you take energy out of the system. And that would work well, I guess, any. At least any sensible friction I can think of. And I think that the argument given before is more the sensible one. I'm really spinning up. I'm putting positive vorticity in the system. I would expect the system to spin up with positive vorticity, or at least along the boundary has to dissipate positive vorticity. If it didn't do that, it's a funny friction that drives the circulation. It's not really what you would call a friction because it manages it to make it circulate the other way around. But as I said, I'm happy to do it after the lecture, but we still have to go through Monk's argument to complete the picture. Yeah. W wouldn't the mic? Yeah, yeah, I just can't see because there is a lie. When the current crosses over the equator, wouldn't the, the flip in the sign of Coriolis affect the current in some way? It seems to be going all the way to the other pole. Uh, here I was plotting only the solution for the northern hemisphere. If you remember, we plot, Stommel plotted the solution for us, so I can just use that one. The meridional flow goes to zero when f goes to zero here, and then it reverses and it goes in the other direction. So I would have two gyres. The gyre in the southern hemisphere flips sign and moves again. The flow is always towards the poles in both hemispheres. You get always western boundary current, one that is moving southward in this case because I have the source in the northern hemisphere. If I put the source in the southern hemisphere, I then I would flip the whole solution and it's a solution like this one, right? I have a boundary current going north and the interior flow. But in the Atlantic, it seems that it keeps going along. You have to be careful that the interior flow is always poleward, right? This is the part of the solution that Stomer is talking about and the sign of F is what dictates which direction you go. Mm -hmm. Now the western boundary current is just there to close the mass budget. Now, it's the source is always to the north, and it's assumed that it's redistributed uniformly through my whole ocean. So I have to bring water down to feed this southward flow here. Right here, now there is no source somewhere here, or at least it's assumed that this is weaker entering there. And so if I want to have forward hole, I have to supply the flow through a western boundary current because my source is still up there, and it's from the north. And actually, there is somebody else? No. Bef oh. uh, good question. So I want to do a thought experiment. If we do have the um, deep water formation in the, um, over the Pacific o Basin, both the uh, uh, North Pole and South Pole, would that be a sufficient 
condition to have a you know similar pattern of of the, of the flow because right now it's, yeah. it's kind of the, the reverse compa compared to the Atlantic, right? Absolutely. And 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 this this argument is based on uh, where you have the source source of the salty water. So I'm just asking if we do have those kind of thing for the Pacific, are we able to have the similar pattern? As in the Atlantic, you would as long as the source of sinking is as large as in the Atlantic, right? That tells you how far. I mean, you still. I'm just trying to close the bus budget. So if you have a very weak source in the Pacific you're not reversing the whole boundary current all the way to the south, but if it's a stronger source than in the south, yes, you would. Um, I don't think there is, even in the recent paleo record, there is any evidence that the convection capacity was that vigorous, but if you go further back in time, it's definitely possible. Not today, at least from what we know, because these are pictures from what are called current meters in the ocean you put uh, a mooring anchored to the ocean bottom and it has small propellers that keep recording velocity and uh, people have tried at least to measure western boundary current now in the two major ocean bays in the pacific and the atlantic and you do see for example in the atlantic you can now follow george's bank was here you see the water coming south uh, along the western boundary through most of the atlantic and in the pacific you see this water moving north um, at least a long stretch Right, so there is some evidence that this western boundary current are really there. They follow the topography. They are consistent, at least somewhat, in sign with Tomel's argument. I'm a bit hesitant in giving a lot of answer to this question because I think by the third lecture I try to convince the, you that these solutions are actually quite misleading and probably have little to do with the real ocean, but they definitely have a lot to do with numerical models for the most part. In the last, what is it, 20 minutes, We'll try to complete the picture. So far, what Stommel has done is a big step forward. He essentially convinced the community that probably there is really this upwelling that drives a horizontal circulation. Um, and he, he made a clear prediction about an observational uh, result of that. What he hadn't really addressed yet is what was driving that upwelling. And this is more what Walter Bank focused on in, a piece in an another seminal paper titled Abyssal Recipes. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Walter Mank and, uh, Carl and Henry Stommel were definitely the founding fathers of modern oceanography, but Walter Mank was better at choosing titles because people keep remembering his paper by title. And in some cases, Stommel doesn't get his fair share just because he didn't have as good a title. Here, Abyssa Recipes is a, a paper that Walter Mank writes, trying indeed to say, well, we cannot measure this vertical velocity, but is there something? What is when the first question is what is driving that vertical velocity, this upwelling that we are all making a big fuss about that seems to be so important. And fair enough, we cannot measure the W, but is there something we can measure that is related to the W a bit more directly that this western boundary current that comes down the line quite a bit? And indeed I think it's important to always realize that two people, uh, Henry Stoma was a real a theoretician in a sense, a GFD or a geophysical fluid dynamicist. So he was really interested mostly in the theory and then applying it to observation. Walter Bank is quite the opposite. He's an observationalist. So he wanted to measure something directly, making too many predictions and relying too much on theory is not something he wanted to be stuck with. So he tried to he tries to rethink the problem and says, well, now let me consider the equation, the other planetary geostrophic equation that Stommel ignored, which is the, ba the density budget or the buoyancy budget, if you want, of the ocean in steady state. So technically this equation is average on sub-inertial time scale, on the geostrophic time scale. He's talking about the large scale circulation. So he says that there is advection of buoyancy that must be balanced on that large scale by vertical diffusion of density. We'll become a bit more explicit why we think that equation might be sensible next lecture. But in some sense, this is the mixing that uh, Bill was talking about in the previous lecture. We're only keeping the vertical component because on large scale, vertical gradients are much larger than horizontal gradient. And what we are parametrizing or representing here is the effect of what Bill has already mentioned about, and I'll come back to why that is what we want to represent. It's the effect of bright gravity wave breaking, so effects that happen on pretty small scale, we are averaging over them, and they're mostly mixing density in the vertical. And what Stommel was thinking about is that he said, let me consider a box like the Pacific. He said, 
Well, water enters in the Pacific, mostly a uh, high latitude through convection, but the convection is all happening up here. By the time the water flows into the Pacific, it's flowing it along a constant density. It's really a flow that comes in a fixed density here, a fixed density there, and floods the abyssal ocean. But now we said that the water has to come out of that box because I keep flowing, letting water flow in into this box, but there has to be some upwelling coming up. At this point, the water that comes up somehow has to cross density surfaces because if I look in the basin, the stratification is mostly vertical. So the water has to come across that density surface, across stratification, the water has to change its buoyancy or its density. It's, com it's entering as dense water and coming out as light water. Now, for a meteorologist, that's never a problem because uh, the atmosphere is transparent to electromagnetic radiation, so radiatively you can cool or warm water parcel. But in the ocean, the electromagnetic radiation doesn't penetrate more than a few meters from the surface, so it's not that easy to uh, change density of water parcel, and that's we're going to see. It's why this abyssal mixing might play a big role or in Monk's argument. We start realizing that maybe this upwelling is strongly linked to turbulence, or so this turbulent mixing at small scale, and there must be some balance between the two. And indeed, he proposed that if I just do the budget across this surface, the vertical advection of density, because now it's the vertical component that has to come out from here, must be equal to the diffusion of buoyancy from above. And that there has to be a balance between these two terms. So he's trying to connect the rate of upwelling to some turbulent diffusion having in mind already that maybe turbulent diffusion is something I can measure better than um, the vertical upwelling itself, and it will turn out to be the case. But for the moment, he's just positing he this budget, and to keep things simple, he's going to say that, I assume again, following Stomer, that the rate of upwelling is uniform, so W is going to be a constant. I'm also assuming that the turbulent diffusivity, or a diff molecular diffusivity for that matter, we don't know yet when it's going to be, it's also constant, because I don't know why it should vary, so I'm just going to ignore it. And uh, I'm also going to assume that the raw disease is constant through the ocean, because you see that the density surfaces are pretty flat. So if I make those approximations, the equation I'm talking about is really this W0 times the raw disease, the uniform upwelling acting on the stratification, must be balanced by a diffusion of heat through that turbulent diffusivity. Now, that's equ an equation simple enough that we can just solve it. It's an exponential solution, and it has an evolving scale that is kappa t over W0. So now the next thing that Stomer does is that he goes and takes some vertical profiles of temperature. So this is depth, and this is potential temperature again. These are a few profiles collected in the Pacific, and they have a profile that looks somewhat exponential. Notice that he stops his measurement, or he's only looking at profiles below a kilometer. He's considering the deep ocean. He knows that the upper ocean uh, is strongly wind-driven, so W is not just responding to the sinking, but it's also responding to wind forcing. So he's ignoring that. And now he tries to fit an exponential to his uh, temperature profile. And by fitting the exponential, he essentially gets what is W0 over kappa t, because that's the evolving scale. And he finds a number of order 1.2 kilo kilometers to the minus 1. That's the fit that he gets here. You can look. The, dotted, the dots are the measurements he had. and. Um, the various fit he did was with a value of 1, 1.1, 1.2, 1 and it's pretty close. <laughs> so now, if you remember, we estimated what that W0 had to be. If you consider the Pacific, he was considering the Pacific. We know there are 15 spheres of water coming into the Pacific. It had estimates from convection at high latitudes of those numbers, so he knew that the velocity had to be 10 to the minus 7 meters per second. So now, he fitted this value from the observation. He knows W0, so he can solve for kappa t because kappa t is just going to be equal to w0 10 to the minus 7 meters per second over his feet of 1.2 per kilometer, and he gets a turbulent diffusivity of 10 to the minus 4 meters squared per second. So that was a very important result to start with, because this value, 10 to the minus 4 meters squared per second, is uh, three orders of magnitude larger than the molecular diffusivity of temperature, and five orders of magnitude larger than molecular diffusivity for salinity. So he said, clearly, this has to be a turbulent process, because I, in order for that balance to occur, if I believe in that uniform upwelling, the turbulent diffusivity required is very large. 
you should also try to remember this number 10 to the minus 4 some people in the community keep arguing they should be called one monk because has dominated the discussion of abyssal mixing ever since because if you believe that there has to be all that uniform upwelling and it has all to be balanced by some diffusion of heat towards the abyss it has to be at that rate and it will turn out to be the case that that rate is not easily observed in the ocean in many places but just to explain what happened next with Walter Monk, now he had a number, he was an observationist, so the first thing he wanted to understand is what can generate, since this has to be a turbulent process, what can generate that much vertical mixing, or are there motions in the ocean that can be uh, sufficiently powerful, and he argued that if you want to mix across density surfaces, large-scale motion are not very effective for two reasons. The first one is that if one way in which you can generate mixing across density surfaces in the ocean interior, you can think that is through what is called the kelvin helmholtz instability. You have some shear, you have density stratification, the system is stably stratified, so it tends to resist mixing. I mean, you have to put energy to bring up dense water and mix it with light water. One way to do it is to reduce Richardson number, to have enough shear in the system that uh, you develop a kelvin helmholtz instability, and this is an example of such. You just generate these billows that overturn, and you see at the beginning you had red warm water over cold, blue water and by the end you had an overturn that generates some water with intermediate value so you mix the two parts uh, the two values however the Richardson number have to be order one technically less than a quarter for the, those overturning to occur large-scale motion typically have geostrophic motion have very large Richardson numbers so they never be able to generate shear instability it's only internal ways that can s generate shear so that large actually if you want to have a small Richardson number you need uh, Internal ways with frequency close to F, that's where most of the shear in the ocean is, and it turns out it's near inertia ways that will generate most of the shear instabilities. The other way you can generate breaking events is by having overturns. Again, internal waves can generate uh, convective instabilities, they become so strongly nonlinear, like surface gravity waves in the beach can become overturn, over can become unstable to overturns. Again, internal waves can do it, just drop in motion, they never generate overturns. So he got convinced that most likely gravity wave breaking was a dominant process in the abyssal ocean, and he started studying properties of internal gravity waves. This is in the 70s, after the abyssal recipe paper in the 60s, mostly in collaboration with a postdoc and then a researcher at Scripps, Chris Garrett. They started developing what are models for the internal wave field in the ocean, mostly focusing on the upper ocean because that's where they had observations. And both from theoretical arguments and from uh, direct observation, they always came out with turbulent diffusivity values by this background internal wave field that were at least an order of magnitude smaller than what Monk had produced. Of course, they were talking about the upper ocean instead of the abyssal ocean, so that could have been one of the reasons for the difference. Um, the other is whether there were other forms of turbulence that were important. People had talked about issues like double diffusion or more esoteric form of diffusion, even though the evidence for other form of diffusion pervasive through the ocean was a bit lacking. So this will be one question they had to address next time. What is important is that this result of Monk had a very profound impact on the whole community. For example, this is a famous paper by Frank Bryan that started looking at the effect of the turbulent diffusivity on the overturning circulation of a numerical model. So again, he constructs a closed box uh, of the ocean, he forces it with some thermal forcing and some winds, but here he has strong cooling, so this is again depth, this is, let's say, the equivalent of our northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, we can think about an Atlantic-like circulation, if you want, or if you prefer, it's a Pacific, then then this would be the southern hemisphere and that would be the northern hemisphere. But regardless, there is cooling here, you see sinking, and this solution, it doesn't matter what the details are, but this overturning is the rate of overturning, there's only average circulation, and he's showing us that for small kappa t, this is 10 to the minus 5 meters squared per second, smaller than what Monk had suggested, he get a very weak overturning of order a few spectrums. If you use a kappa t of order 10 to the minus 4 meters squared per second, the value that Monk had talked about, he gets overturning of order 10 Sverdrup or so, which is not very far from the 15 Sverdrup. If you use a kappa t of order of 10 to the minus 3 meters squared per second, he gets an overturning, which is now order of 25, 30 Sverdrups. So he said, yes, it's very sensitive to the value of kappa t, 
maybe that turbine diffusivity is really what powers the overturning we are talking about. So now Monk has even made a direct contact between this upwelling and something we directly observe the turbulent diffusivity, and that's the way we could close the question, is by measuring the turbulent diffusivity, which is what we're going to discuss next. So, so if, if I understand well, I mean, you have presented the relation between S0, omega 0, and then the the turbulent diffusion, yeah. but the causality goes the other way around. It's the turbulent diffusion that uh, explain omega zero, that explain S zero. Uh, we didn't correct? say what drives what. This would get a bit closer to what drives what, because now by changing the kappa t, he's indeed changing the overturning, so I would suggest that kappa t can affect strongly the overturning situation, but yes, it has an answer to the question that we'll come to, uh, who drives what. But here, I think in both cases there was a big statement on trying. Paolo wants to ask something, but uh, as I finish, there was a big statement is that can you observe something that suggests that there is that upwelling, that there is that uniform return flow? And in some sense, he said, well, if there is, you must observe a turbulent diffusivity, which is pretty substantial because it's a lot of water coming up. I think yeah. energetically, uh, Freddie is exactly right. What is powering is th the mixing. Energetically, he's right that that's what is powering. Sure. But the problem with the mixing is that then you have to answer the question, you know, it's acting on a background stratification, so how much upwelling you get depends on both, and you don't know yet. I mean, here, I think that in Monk's argument, what he was brave about is to try to use an argument that was that simple and push it all the way and come out with a turbulent diffusivity value. I think over time people have lost a bit the sense of how brave he was because it's based on a few sections and whether that is representative of the whole ocean is still an open question and whether that number of 10 to the minus 4 really should be 10 to the minus 4 or something around 10 to the minus 4 is an open question. But very quickly to conclude, now I just want to show you a bit what we know today about the abyssal circulation. Now these were the basic theories and I didn't want to present these pictures at the beginning because I wanted to, to let people think about what Stommel and Monk knew when they tried to come up, when they came out with their fundamental arguments. Now we know quite a bit more about the overturning, and so the picture is much more nuanced, and there are elements that we need to revise. So now here I'm showing picture of the zonally average circulation in the global ocean. These are estimated from data collected, again, through this World, World Ocean Circulation Experiment. This was an experiment run in the 90s where we the full observational oceanographic community went around all oceans for a decade measuring sections of velocities, temperature and salinity across Pacific, Indian and Atlantic Ocean so that we can now make pictures of this kind that we couldn't before that experiment. This is a paper that received a lot of attention by Lumpkin and Spear where they tried to do this estimate and again now this is depth while this is neutral density. Neutral density is again a density where we subtracted the uh, compressive effects. So it's the dynamic part of density, but it's just a nice vertical label to see what density the waters are at. And this is latitude, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, and just to show you that what you see is that there are two big s overturning cells. If you take this zonal average over the global ocean, there is a cell that is associated with sinking at low latitudes in the southern hemisphere. The water come back and fold on themselves, and then there is a circulation which instead is associated with sinking in the northern hemisphere, mostly in the Atlantic, that comes to the south, comes to the southern, southern ocean and comes back. The, the color is just the mass transport? Or uh, or yes, the color is the mass transport. So this is in Sverdrup's between 10, the blue is order 10 Sverdrup's and the red, strong red is order of 20 Sverdrup's. We're going to call the upper cell the deep cell and the lower cell the abyssal cell. So now we're getting to what abyssal is as opposed to what deep is. And to understand it a bit better, instead of taking the global average, we can split the average, or at least Lumpkin and Spear split the average between the Atlantic and the Pacific. So if we look at the overturning only at the Atlantic, now you see that this upper cell, what I call the deep cell, is mostly an Atlantic uh, characteristics. You have this sink of water coming north, now we don't see it because we cut it at 32 degrees south. This water then comes at the surface in the southern ocean and comes back. But you see that the circulation is mostly, and this is the reason why I plotted the circulation, or they plotted the circulation as a function of density, you see that it hardly changes its density surface. So that circulation doesn't really cross density surfaces. So all these arguments that you see through Monk of water crossing density surface definitely doesn't apply here. There isn't much W not to talk about. The deep cell seems to be mostly adiabatic. Uh, 
in the sense that you have sinking a lot of transformational water in the high latitudes, then the water is mostly a constant density and then come up at the surface uh, where it's transformed again by exposure to surface air sea fluxes. And uh, Paola will talk at length about the properties of that circulation. But it's quite distinct from anything that uh, both Stommel and uh, Walter Monk had in mind. Another property that you'll notice about the circulation here, what has been plotted is the typical height of uh, abyssal um, sea mounts and ridges. And you see that this circulation is largely all above those sills. So it's adiabatic and it's removed from topography for the most part. If you look at the Pacific, we get a very different picture. The water is now entering from the south because there is no, no uh, formation of dense water in the northern hemisphere. This water is coming from the south, it's overturning and coming back. Now, this water is clearly, this is again as a function of density, it's really changing density in the ocean interior. So here there is a lot of density transformation. And uh, these lines, again, are the typical topographic heights. I think the black ones are in the Pacific and the gray ones are in the Indian. This is the Indo-Pacific picture, just hard to divide the Indian and the Pacific because they are connected. Um, and you see this overturning is mostly at depths below where there are sea mounts. So this overturning is always in contact with topography. This is the part that seems to be more relevant and connected to the arguments that Stommel and Monk were making. Indeed, there is an overturning of that kind also in the Atlantic. It just squeezes further down and it's a bit weaker. But also this overturning circulation with dense water becoming lighter and coming back up, it's again below topographic features. So you heard <laughs> Bill in the previous lecture mentioning that there is topographic generation of gravity waves. Gravity waves are generated when you have either barot any barotropic motions or motion that project the ocean bottom and interacts with topography, you can generate waves. We said the waves is probably what supports uh, mixing. And indeed, that's where you observe a lot of that overturning circulation. It's important to note that the model of Garrett and Monk about internal gravity waves were talking mostly about wind-generated gravity waves, not the topographic generated gravity waves. On top of it, this overturning seems to be quite disconnected from anything that has to do with the upper ocean. And that's something we'll have to go back to. And I think we're much done. I just want to say that as the last slide, finally, we're going to insist that what I mean by abyssal ocean is the ocean that is associated with this abyssal circulation and stratification. And that's what we want to be able to describe both observationally and theoretically in the next two lectures. While the deep circulation is something that Pala will talk about, which is this Atlantic circulation, which is more adiabatic and it's not as obviously connected with turbulent mixing and gravity wave breaking. I can let you read this. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe let me just say that in density space, that circulation, this abyssal circulation looks pretty squeezed down, especially in the Atlantic. You should always remember that it spans nearly 2,000 meters of water. It's pretty deep. So it's half of the ocean is abyssal for the most part. So it's not a small component. Um, uh, here. Mm. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so in the previous slide, um, the gray contours are the topography? Yes. So how can there be circulation below topography? Ah, sorry. <laughs> Let me explain. It means I didn't explain myself well. This is the characteristic height of sea mounts and topographic ridges. So it's the equivalent of a Mont Blanc, but there are Mont Blancs everywhere in the southern or in the abyssal ocean. There are big valleys in between. So the circulation is in the abyssal ocean. The deepest point of the ocean is actually this gray area. So you see, it's much deeper than that. It's just that here there are some topographic hills or some sea mounts that stick up quite a bit or ridges that stick up quite a bit above the surface. We're just saying that somewhere at some longitude in the ocean below here there is topography. While above here there are only the continental shelf left but there is no topography in the middle of the ocean which are quite important to generate internal gravity waves in the abyss. Um, is there a way to distinguish the topography that will generate internal waves and that which will break it, break internal waves? It's a very good question and we're going to address it next time and a bit in the third lecture. Yes, there are ways, but not, uh, but it's definitely a, an active area of research, so there are attempts to do it.
So before you go, I mean, uh, th there will be this week some uh, tutorials and some discussion. So I will just ask Paola to explain what will be the tutorial uh, this afternoon. At, so the tutorial.